questions in this area. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. Question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Michael Matheson misused taxpayers' money. He made a false claim for £11,000. He misled the public, the press and this parliament. But when the scandal came to light, the SNP circled the wagons and backed him to the hilt. They said he was a person of integrity and character. The SNP said this matter was closed, but they must surely accept the full scale of the deceit and abuse of trust now it is proposed that he is banned from this parliament for 27 days. Now he is still sitting on the SNP benches today. So will John Swinney do the right thing and kick Michael Matheson out of the SNP and does the First Minister accept that the SNP were wrong to fully support Michael Matheson? Um, First Minister, um, we are of, of course clear that this session is to put questions to the First Minister in his capacity as First Minister and to address matters for which the Scottish Government has responsibility. And I will allow the First Minister to respond in relation to those responsibilities. President Officer, at the outset, I have to make clear to Parliament that Michael Matheson is a friend and a colleague of mine. He has made mistakes, he has resigned from the Cabinet, and he paid the roaming costs in question. There has been no cost to the public purse. But as I consider the findings from the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, I have a significant concern. I believe this process has been prejudiced, and let me explain why. Stephen Kerr and Annie Wells both made comments about this case long before it came to the committee that prejudged the case. Stephen Kerr, Stephen Kerr had the good grace to admit that he could not, and I quote, could not meet the committee requirement to be unbiased, so he removed himself from the committee. He was replaced by Oliver Mundell, who made no public comment on this case, and I have no issue with Mr Mundell's participation in the inquiry. But Annie Wells did make public comments. On the 27th of November, Annie Wells said that Michael Matheson's, and I quote, desperate efforts to justify his outrageous expenses claim have been riddled with lies, cover-ups, and the need for us all to suspend our disbelief. Presiding officer, if a constituent came to me, if a constituent came to me and said they were about to face a disciplinary panel at work and one of its members had made prejudicial comments about them, I would come down on that employer like a ton of bricks. That is the situation that Michael Matheson is facing here, and that is why I will not be supporting this sanction. Douglas Ross. This is incredible. Michael Matheson claimed £11,000 from the taxpayer. He expected the taxpayer to pick up his... Mr Ross, Mr Ross, be gra very grateful if we conduct ourselves in a courteous and respectful manner, as required of us by standing orders. Mr Ross. Michael Matheson misled the public, misled the press, misled this parliament. He expected the taxpayers of Scotland to pay £11,000 for a bill that he had racked up. And it is not Annie Wells or Oliver Mundell or Martin Whitfield or Jackie Dunbar or Alistair Allen that found Michael Matheson guilty. It was the parliamentary corporate body that is represented by members across this chamber. Shockingly, John Swinney is standing here today defending the indefensible. MSPs must be honest. Michael Matheson wasn't. MSPs must act with integrity. Michael Matheson didn't. MSPs must be trusted by the public. Michael Matheson isn't. He has been banned from this parliament for a few weeks, but in the real world, 
he would have lost his job for what he did and what he claimed. Now, John Swinney has said in his own words, he and Michael Matheson are good friends and colleagues. They served in Cabinet together for almost a decade. So does John Swinney believe that Michael Matheson's actions, not any other sanctions, but his actions were acceptable and would they be acceptable for any Member of Parliament? And can I ask the First Minister if at any stage since this scandal first came to light, did he make any personal representations to support Michael Matheson? First Minister. President Officer, on Mr Ross's uh, last specific question, I, before I became First Minister, I drew the issues about Stephen Kerr's comments and Annie Wells to the attention of the Convener of the Standards Public Appointments and Procedures Committee, which I thought it was important for me to do as a senior, long-serving Member of Parliament, because I'm interested in the integrity of this Parliament. <laughs> and unfortunately, and unfortunately, the integrity of the Parliament is being brought into question because... We continue, First Minister. The integrity of Parliament is being brought into question because a member of the committee has not done what Mr Kerr did, which was accept that they should recuse themselves from the committee. Now, I have no issue, I have no issue with the participation of the Conservative member on the corporate body, because Jackson Carlaw has made no public comments about this case. But I do have an issue where people have prejudged the case, because that brings this Parliament into disrepute. And I, and I come back, and I, and I come back, presiding officer, and I come back, presiding officer, to the point I made in my earlier remarks, that if a constituent came to me and said they were about to face a disciplinary panel at work and one of its members had made prejudicial comments about them, I would come down on that employer like a ton of bricks. Now, lastly, presiding officer, I said in my earlier answer that Michael Matheson had made mistakes. He resigned from the Cabinet. He lost his job as a member of the Cabinet and he paid the roaming costs in question. There was no cost to the public purse as a consequence of the issues that have been raised here about the conduct of this process, I don't believe this is a sanction that can be applied. Douglas Ross. This is incredible and indefensible by the First Minister. He said, he told us, when asking for our support to make him First Minister, he would be First Minister for all of Scotland. What Scotland is seeing is he's the First Minister that backs his pals. He is supporting Michael Matheson as a friend and colleague, not doing the right thing for Scotland or this Parliament. And I'm sorry. My colleague Annie Wells and Oliver Mundell and every member on that committee went in to do their job as they were asked to do by this Parliament. And if anyone has brought the Scottish Parliament into disrepute, it's a member who tried to claim £11,000 from the Scottish taxpayer and tried to get away with it. Now, the seriousness of this incident and the deep damage the conduct of Michael Matheson has done to public trust in this Parliament demands that he must resign. But we know from his conduct so far that he is unlikely to do that. What will shock and appall people across Scotland is he is now being endorsed by the First Minister of this country. So if the SNP are not going to do the right thing for Scotland, then I can announce today that the Scottish Conservatives will seek to bring forward a vote in this chamber next week. Our motion will state that Michael Matheson should resign for misusing taxpayers' money and making false statements to the public, the press and Parliament. Will John Swinney do what he promised he would and lead this government on behalf of the whole of Scotland and support our calls for Michael Matheson to resign or will he simply support his nationalist friend? Yeah. First Minister. President Officer, I, I don't think anybody could look at me and think that I am not an individual who 
cares deeply about the reputation and the integrity of this Parliament. I have been in this Parliament I've been in this Parliament for 25 years, since its foundation. It has been the privilege of my life to serve in this Parliament, and I am the only member of this Parliament who voted for the establishment of this Parliament in the House of Commons when the Scotland Act was put to the House of Commons in 1998. So I care deeply about the reputation and the integrity and the identity of this Parliament, which is why I think there is the risk that deep damage will be done to this Parliament's reputation if the issue... Do continue, First Minister. If the issue that I have raised is not addressed properly as I invited the Standards Committee to address properly. So, no, I will not support calls for Michael Matheson to resign. Michael Matheson has suffered significant uh, reputational damage and impact on his and impact on his family as a consequence of losing office and the difficulties that have been p created here. And he has paid all of the roaming costs in question. There is no cost to the public purse. And I think this Parliament needs to consider seriously the reputational issues that will arise from presiding over an unfair process. Douglas Ross. The First Minister has to consider carefully his reputation and the reputation of this Parliament if he continues down the route he seems to be going. Let's be clear, if our motion is successful next week and Michael Matheson does the right thing, finally, and resigns as a member of this Parliament, the people of Falkirk West could have the chance on the 4th of July, when there's a general election anyway, to choose an MSP who is honest and an MSP who has integrity. Michael Matheson made a false claim for £11,000. That is beyond doubt. He was untruthful to the press, to the public and Mi to Parliament. Sorry, Mr Ross. Mr Fitzpatrick, I would be grateful if you would desist from commenting from your seat. Mr Ross, do continue. Michael Matheson made a false claim for £11,000 of taxpayers' money. He was untruthful, without any doubt, to the public of Scotland, to the press who cover our proceedings, and to this Parliament, including our presiding officer. But the SNP claimed there was nothing to see here. They defended Michael Matheson every step of the way, and the First Minister is continuing with that today. Anyone in the real world would have lost their job for what Michael Matheson did. But John Swinney is saying today that it's acceptable for an MSP to take public money and then not be honest about it because he disagrees with a sanction of this Parliament. Well, I have to say the public disagrees and they will soon have the chance to have their say on this scandal. They have an opportunity to remove SNP politicians who let them down. In seats up and down Scotland, it will be a straight fight between the SNP and the Scottish Conservatives. So does John Swinney believe that the SNP will be punished for their handling of this scandal and his actions on the 4th of July? First, First Minister, First Minister. Um, before you respond, First Minister, I would remind chambers that I would remind members that the chamber is not the place to campaign um, for a UK general election. I do not want campaigning to distract members from their focus on issues that are the responsibility of this Parliament and the Scottish Government. First Minister. President, President I think um, Douglas Ross's last question to me reveals what this is all about. Because I have, uh, I have set out that Michael Matheson made mistakes, that he has resigned from the Cabinet and that he paid in full the costs of the roaming charges, so there has been no cost to the public purse. Now, my job as First Minister, as I promised Parliament, is to improve the lives of people in Scotland. My challenge in doing that is that I'm having to lead a government that is having to face up to 14 years of punishing austerity from the United Kingdom government. I'm having to lead a government that's having to face up to the consequences in Scotland of Brexit. I'm having to lead a government facing 
the hard realities of the cost of living crisis that's been inflicted on our country by the mismanagement of the economy by the Conservative government. I look forward to setting out to the people of Scotland in this election the difficulties that have been created by the folly of Douglas Ross and his colleagues, and I know the people of Scotland will support the SNP in that process. Before I call Mr Sarwar, I would be grateful if members would conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful way. We have many members who wish to put questions today. I call Anna Sarwar. Officer, what we've heard today from the First Minister is utterly unbelievable and embarrassing. He has demeaned himself and the office of First Minister. Two weeks in and the pretense of a new kind of government is gone. Party first, country second. And he talks about the actions that should be judged here. It's not the actions of a committee that should be judged. It's the actions of a member who attempted to wrongly claim £11,000 of public money. And in the real world, that employee would lose their job, not have their bosses running around try to protect them. And that's what we've got from this First Minister. And all the complaints now happening after the process has concluded, why weren't the government benches complaining about this before the process started rather than after the process had concluded? The wider government I'm talking about, not just one individual. And let's also look at what's happening here. Every single day, the two governments are getting more and more alike. Let's not forget how Boris Johnson was judged when he thought he could stand against the processes of the UK Parliament yeah. when it came to individual members Absolutely. of the Conservatives. Absolutely. Don't forget how Liz Truss was judged when she did the same. And let's see how Rishi Sunak will be judged when he does that, when he puts party before country. And isn't it the case that John Swinney and this SNP government will be judged too? Do the right thing for once. Put the integrity of our parliament and our democracy before your political party and demand that Michael Matheson resigns so the people of his constituency can vote for someone who's on their side, not fighting for themselves. Yeah. First Minister. I am interested in putting parliament first. That's why, before any of this kicked off, I wrote on two occasions to the Convener of the Standards, Public Appointments and Procedures Committee because I was concerned of the danger to the reputation of the Parliament because of the fact that a process was going to be undertaken where members had prejudged the process. That is an issue. And Mr Sarwar will share my perspective on the issue of employees' rights. And we've got to have fair processes within our Parliament. And I set out why I thought those processes were at risk of being unfair. Now, Mr Sarwar asks about the, uh, the, the, the raising of these concerns and the appropriate course of action to be taken. I would remind Mr Sarwar that in the case that he refers to about Boris Johnson, Chris Bryant, one of his colleagues in the House of Commons, recused himself from the parliamentary process, the standards process in the House of Commons, because Mr Bryant had expressed public remarks about the Boris Johnson case. So Mr, Mr Bryant did the appropriate action to protect the process. The process has not been protected here. And I, am, I come at this issue from the, 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 the fundamental Christian maxim of doing unto others what you would have done unto yourself. And what worries me is that what is going to be, what is proposed here is something that none of us would like to have done to us because of its unfairness. And that's the issue that Parliament's got to confront. Again, no one is going to believe this from John Swinney. Let's not pretend that John Swinney somehow holds every member across this Parliament or across the Westminster Parliament as an equal. This is an SNP government that's famous for holding itself to a lower standard than it holds the rest of the country. That's why it's one rule for everybody else and one standard for the SNP. If Michael Matheson 
was a Labour MSP, I guarantee this would not be John Swinney's response. If Michael Matheson was a Conservative MSP, I guarantee this would not be Michael, uh, sorry, John Swinney's response, because for him, it's party first, country second. It was the case with the way he handled the salmon inquiry, and it's the exact same case with how he's dealing with this. In case it be forgotten, Mr Wanting to pretend that he's the integrity symbol of the Parliament. Mr. We Sarwar, came, we came Mr. to this Sarwar, Parliament. We were, Mr Sarwar, we do not use names other than proper names, so please remember that as you conclude your remarks. I apologise, President Officer. If you remember in the last Parliament, we had to come to this chamber to force John Swinney to provide evidence to a committee of this Parliament. So no pretending of respecting the integrity of individual committees of this Parliament. People can see right through exactly what is happening here. Michael Massey should do the right thing. He should stand down and he should allow a by-election. And if John Swinney was going to do the right thing, he would demand him, uh, that of him too. But it shouldn't be up to Michael Matheson and it shouldn't be up to John Swinney. We supported, as did the SNP, the right to recall of MPs who were suspended for more than 10 days of the Parliament. Again, Scotland lags behind Westminster on that. So does the First Minister support the right of recall of MSPs? And if so, does he think those that are suspended for over 10 days should be face a recall petition so that the public can decide whether they believe they have an integrity in the politician that they send to this parliament to represent them? First Minister. Um, President Officer, you know, that's a, a proposition which parliament can consider. Uh, the government is perfectly open to considering that uh, proposal and I believe that recall arrangements are appropriate um, and Parliament needs to scrutinise the basis upon which they put them forward. But I, I, I honestly say to Parliament that it has to be very careful about what it's doing here because the example that Chris Bryant said is the example which I think we should all be mindful about. That where an individual had prejudged a case, they judged they could not take part in it. There is natural justice at stake here. And whoever we are, and I would be concerned about it, wherever that person was within the chamber, because I want Parliament to exercise its responsibilities fairly and openly in relation to all members. That's, now, Mr Sawar says that I, I, th 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 there are other issues that I've not raised concerns about. I said in my comments earlier on, that when Oliver Mundell replaced Stephen Kerr, and Mr Kerr withdrew from the committee because he had prejudiced his position, I've raised no issues about Oliver Mundell, because Mr Mundell made no comments about this process. I'm simply saying that Parliament is setting a very dangerous precedent by the way this matter is being handled. Yes. The example Michael Matheson set. What about the example that Hamza Yusuf set when he stood by him? And what about the example John Swinney is now setting by trying to demean this parliament in order to protect one of his friends? Because the SNP are quick to demand action at Westminster, but they always seem to hold themselves to a lower standard here in Scotland. For too long now, people have felt that those in power are in it for themselves or want to put their party before the country. And this is what they've had to put up with. Weak and incompetent leadership, financial mismanagement, no idea how to govern, pitting community against community, mired in scandal, believing they are above the law, breaking public services, a track record of failure. Not just the Tories, it's also now the perfect description of this SNP government led by John Swinney. So as people across the country finally get to make their judgment on two governments that have treated this public with contempt, isn't it the case that they have an opportunity to clean up our politics, restore integrity and decency again, and actually have governments focused on changing our country rather than protecting themselves. First Minister. I've made pretty clear over the last couple of weeks that I'm going to positively and enthusiastically set out the record of this SNP government because it has enhanced the lives of people in Scotland. When Anna Sauer's government left office, people in this country got 412 hours of early learning and childcare. Yeah. That was what Labour thought was enough yeah. for families on low income. Now it's more than double because of the choices yeah. made by this government to look after the interests of children in our country. Yeah. The two-child limit 
The Labour Party want to keep the two-child limit, which is keeping 10,000 children in Scotland in poverty, yeah. when this government has put a child payment in place yeah. which is protecting 100,000 children from going into poverty. So when Anna Sauer comes here and wants to challenge me about the record of the SNP government, I'll defend the record of the SNP government because it's delivering a higher quality of life than the Labour government did in Scotland in 2007, and I'm proud of what we've achieved. Question number three, Lorna Slater. The Scottish Greens welcomed the commitment yesterday from the First Minister to prioritise the climate emergency. All the evidence is clear. Preventing climate breakdown means leaving new oil and gas in the ground. As part of government, the Scottish Greens worked hard to ensure that the draft energy strategy contained a landmark presumption against new oil and gas exploration. This is consistent with the science. That position has been thrown into doubt this week by the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero, who branded proposals for no new oil and gas during a climate emergency as too extreme. When will the Scottish Government publish the now long overdue final energy strategy? Can the First Minister commit to ensuring Parliament will have time to scrutinise this before recess? And will it still contain the presumption against new oil and gas which was consulted on? First Minister. President, officer, the, uh, the issues that, that Lorna Slater raises with me are, of course, or have been the subject of consultation. Uh, the Government will bring forward, as I set out uh, yesterday, the energy strategy. Uh, obviously, we are now in a slightly different position because of the uh, election rules as to how, what the Government can bring to Parliament, because we have to be mindful of the propriety advice we get from the Permanent Secretary about the issues that we can bring to Parliament in, a, in, a pre -elect, in an election period. But what I can say to uh, Lawrence Slater is that the government's focus is on meeting the country's energy security needs, on reducing emissions in line with climate commitments and delivering affordable energy supplies in doing so, ensuring that a just transition for the oil and gas workforce is secured to a net zero future as the resources in the North Sea decline. Lawrence Slater. New oil and gas exploration will not guarantee us energy security. There is no security for homeowners when the cost of heating their home is still tied to volatile gas markets. There is no security for oil and gas workers trapped in a declining industry. And there is no security for communities who need a just transition instead of arguments about how many drops of oil we can still squeeze out. Isn't it clear that with Labour dumping their green investment plans and pledging to keep every Tory oil and gas licence in place, and the SNP back to their old habit of trying to face both ways to the fossil fuel industry, that it's only the Scottish Greens who are giving clear and urgent response to the climate emergency. First Minister. Well, in the course of the last, in the short period in which I've been the First Minister, the government has announced two very significant investments, one at uh, Ardizir and the other at NIG, which are essential to the renewable energy industry in Scotland and the development of the offshore wind sector. These are enormous investments which signal the commitment of the government. Now, yesterday in my statement of priorities to Parliament, I made the point that Scotland has developed under the lifetime of this government um, a position of significant advance on electricity generation from renewable energy. When we came to office, around about 20% of Scotland's uh, electricity consumption came from renewable sources. That has now reached 113%. That is a sizeable transformation in decarbonisation of electricity, which should be welcomed, and the government will build on that by the support that we're putting in place for the renewable energy sector within Scotland. Question number four, Gordon MacDonald. First Minister, what the potential implications are for Scotland's economy of the UK government's immigration policy changes for graduates? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I'm deeply concerned at reports that the United Kingdom government is considering introducing further measures uh, to restrict the graduate visa route, and I have written to the Prime Minister to emphasise that there is no economic or educational argument for such a proposal. 
Any restrictions to international students' ability to stay and work in Scotland after graduation would damage the higher education sector and our wider economy. 60% of the Scottish public support a graduate visa, while the UK Government's own Migration Advisory Committee has recommended retaining the graduate route in its current form. Scotland's distinct demographic challenge means that it is crucial that we have the tools to attract and retain people in Scotland. That should be our focus, not turning people away. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the First Minister for that answer. University Scotland has written to the UK Government stating that further restrictions to the graduate route would benefit literally no one and pointing out that international students have made a net positive contribution of at least £4.75 billion to the Scottish economy. Does the First Minister agree that even the threat of changes to the graduate route could damage our international reputation and shows why decisions about immigration should be made in Scotland to allow us to put Scotland first and make decisions in our economic interest? First Minister. I, I do agree with Mr Macdonald, Presiding Officer. I think it is clear that the graduate visa route has resulted in significant economic benefit to our communities because it has essentially anchored the educational achievements of some of the brightest people in the world uh, contributing to the Scottish economy through our universities and the further activity that flows from that. So this is a, a very short-sighted route. Now, obviously, um, I, I am uncertain as to whether the Prime Minister will take a decision in this context uh, of an imminent election to change the graduate visa route. But I do assure our university community of the uh, steadfast support and, uh, and assistance of the Scottish Government in doing all that we can to avoid the graduate visa route being in any way altered because it benefits Scotland and our institutions. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Migration Advisory Committee mentioned earlier also stated that it is the failure to properly fund the sector that has led to an increasing over-reliance on immigration. They go on to say that they have had no indication in discussion with ministers that there is any plan in place to address this structural underfunding. Yeah. Has the First Minister got any plan in place to address the structural underfunding of Scottish universities by the SNP Government? First Minister. Uh, the, uh, the Scottish Government gives significant financial support to the university sector. But of course, the Scottish Government has got to live within the resources that are made available to us through the Barnett formula and the funding of the public purse. And people at Liam Kerr have to waken up and realise that there is a consequence of 14 years of austerity. It puts insufferable pressure in our public finances, and the people who are responsible for the, those 14 years of austerity are Liam Kerr and his Conservative colleagues. So we as a government will do all that we can to support the university sector, but people at Liam Kerr need to face up to the implications of the damaging decisions of the United Kingdom Conservative government. Willie Rennie. For the first time, the income from international students surpassed that from domestic students. That's because of the excellent reputation of Scottish universities, but it also poses a risk because being so dependent on funding that is subject to global volatility. The First Minister will know about the financial difficulties reported at Aberdeen University, where there is significant doubt over the ability to continue. It's very stark, alongside reports about other universities and four colleges. So what are his thoughts about how to address this situation, which is not going away and is only going to get worse? First Minister. Uh, I take seriously the point that Mr Rainey raises, but it relates obviously directly to the public finances. And the government, of course, has taken st a stance on the public finances where we have um, been prepared to uh, increase tax, to increase the resources that we've got available to us to invest in key sectors such as the, univers the university sector or the college sector. The Funding Council is obviously engaged directly with institutions to support them in the challenges that they face. Uh, but obviously, I would make the point that the continuation of austerity, which is now having such a punishing effect on our public finances, is a material factor that we have to address. And the opportunity to do that uh, is in front of the country in the forthcoming election. Question number five, Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that no NHS board has implemented placental growth factor-based testing for preeclampsia in light of it having been recommended in March 
2023 by the Scottish Health Technologies Group. First Minister. President Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to continuous improvement in maternity safety across Scotland to deliver the best and safest care for mothers and babies. We expect all NHS boards to ensure the Scottish Health Technologies Group recommendations on placental growth factor based testing are implemented effectively and consistently. NHS boards are currently in the initial phases of implementing PLGF testing and we have written again to NHS boards to secure an update on their current position and to determine if further support is necessary to progress implementation plans. Tess White. First Minister, women in Scotland are being denied a test and I welcome what the First Minister has, has just said because this could save their lives and the lives of their babies. The test is already being used widely in NHS England and it's clear Scotland has been on the back foot with implementation with health boards indicating funding is a major obstacle. First Minister, what price can we put on mother and baby's lives? If this SNP government is serious about women's health, can the First Minister tell us when these resources will be made available to all health boards for these life-saving tests? First Minister. This is a very important issue. I want to uh, reassure Tess White that the Health Secretary is actively pursuing this, uh, this issue with health boards around the country. Uh, obviously, in terms of financial support, the government has provided a real terms increase in resources for the health service around the country. Um, but clearly, there is a very significant demand and pressure on those resources. So I can't give Tess White an immediate answer about timescales. But what I will do is make sure that the Health Secretary writes to her once we have had the, the feedback from health boards about the state of preparation in which they are involved to ensure that her legitimate concerns are properly addressed in correspondence uh, at a later date. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, yesterday was World Pre-Eclampsia Day. Women in Scotland have died, babies in Scotland have died, so these words today will not reassure anyone. I've had written answers from the Women's Health and Public Health Minister today telling us about uh, scoping inquiries and uh, writing again to health boards because of the capacity and infrastructure challenges they have raised. This is not good enough. This is reactive. This is because people with lived experience are campaigning, demanding urgent action, including those aligned with action in preeclampsia. And because of the Sunday Post campaign that was launched on Sunday, again, the government is on the back foot. The lives of women and babies are at risk, and sadly, some have died. So will the First Minister and other relevant ministers meet as a matter of priority with people who are directly impacted and learn from what is actually already rolled out in Wales and England, because women in Scotland deserve the same. Minister. I, 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 again, I take seriously the point that uh, Monica Lennon has made, and I'll be very happy to meet with the, the Health Secretary and with the relevant uh, campaigners uh, to address this issue, and perhaps it might be appropriate if uh, we had a meeting with Tess White and Monica Lennon on this question. Um, uh, we, we, are, we, do, we recognise the significance and the benefit of the testing arrangements. Uh, we have to make sure that health boards are responding actively to that call and we will put in place the measures to ensure that members of parliament are updated about that and we will arrange that discussion. Question number six, Katie Clark. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on what action the Scottish Government is taking to support the Ferguson Marine Shipyard. First Minister. President Officer, when the Ferguson Marine Shipyard was threatened with closure in 2019, this Government stepped forward and saved the shipyard. Taking the yard into public ownership preserved commercial shipbuilding on the Clyde, rescued more than 300 jobs and ensured that the Glen Sanex and Glen Rosa vessels, vital for our island communities, will be delivered. We want to see the yard prosper, be competitive and continue the proud shipbuilding traditions on the Clyde. The Deputy First Minister recently met with unions, workers at the shipyard as well as parliamentary colleagues and as she said on that occasion, the Government will leave no stone unturned in pursuing a successful, sustainable future for the yard and the workers who are employed there. Katie Clark. Investment is essential to reconfigure the yard to undo changes made whilst in private ownership and many are warning that time is running out. 
State aid rules are obviously complex, but countries like Italy rely on the exemptions to invest in shipbuilding. Does the First Minister recognise the urgency of the situation and will he find a pathway to ensure support is provided given the strategic importance of the yard? First Minister. I, 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 I do recognise the urgency and ministers are very much aware of uh, the urgency. The discussions the Deputy First Minister has had with the uh, relevant unions and the representatives of the workforce make that point powerfully to us. Um, we are considering proposals in relation to investment and the due diligence work is underway. We are trying to conclude that as soon as we possibly can do to ensure that we can, uh, as we have done in the past, uh, support the yard to ensure it continues the important tradition and the effectiveness of shipbuilding on the Clyde. Colin Beattie. The shipyard is hugely significant to both local and national economies, and it's vital we do all we can to secure a sustainable future for the site. Could the First Minister provide an update on the Scottish Government's conversations with Ferguson Marine executives and trade unions following the Deputy First Minister's attendance at the summit organised by the GMB last week? First Minister. I, I think what I'd say to uh, Mr Beattie is that obviously there were very constructive discussions at the yard with the management and the workforce. Um, the, uh, many of the issues that Katie Clark raised with me were raised directly with the Deputy First Minister and that is being considered within the government and we will come to a conclusion as soon as we possibly can do on these important issues. Thank you. Move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Douglas Lumsden. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, last week there was a tragic accident at Balmiri where one-year-old Ivy May Ross sadly lost her life. Our parents are devastated and my thoughts and prayers are with them. No ambulances were available to attend the incident as they were all stacked up outside Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, so the Special Operations Response Team, who normally deal with hazardous incidents, were deployed to the scene. The team, I believe, did a fantastic job, and I am in no way trying to say the outcome would have been different if a regular ambulance crew was available. But this tragic incident should be a wake-up call to the Scottish Government. So will the First Minister intervene and do all that he can to stop ambulances queuing for hours on end to drop off patients at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary? First Minister. President, so let me begin by expressing my deepest sympathy to the family of um, Ivy May Rose. Um, I'm terribly sorry about the heartbreak that they are having to endure after this tragic accident. I think Mr Lumsden um, fairly characterises the situation that took place. Uh, the SORT team arrived um, very swiftly at the site, um, but, but obviously it would be preferable and desirable for there to be ambulance crews available to attend such a... The SORT team is an ambulance crew, but the, I, I know the point that Mr Lumsden is making about the importance of ambulances being free. Um, I, it wasn't the case that all of the ambulances were stacked at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. There were a number out on other calls, but a number were uh, uh, stacked at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And I, I think this is an important reminder of the importance of ensuring there is... A, a, a very swift uh, transfer of patients at hospitals to make sure that the ambulance capacity we have is available to be deployed where it requires to be deployed. And I'll make sure that the issues that Mr Lumsden raises with me are conveyed to the Health Board as a consequence. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to build an economy that is strong, successful and dynamic. And the £5 million funding package announced by the Scottish Government this week to, start, uh, to support start-up businesses is testament to that commitment. However, uh, many of the powers we need to grow our economy remain um, uh, reserved. Does the First Minister share my concern that Westminster economic mismanagement continues to hold Scotland's economy back? And does he share my view that with a strong SNP voice at Westminster, we can continue to make clear that this just isn't good enough for Scotland? Um, before the First Minister responds, if I may again remind members that the Chamber is not the place to be electioneering, and I don't want campaigning to distract members from focusing on matters for which the government has general responsibility. First Minister. 
uh, on those matters. Sir, uh, Mr Stewart is correct that, uh, about the government's intention in Scotland of trying to do all that we can to support entrepreneurship and innovation within Scotland. The £5 million funding package that was announced to support innovation and taking forward the recommendations of the work of Mark Logan and Anna Stewart is an important contribution to supporting that innovation ecosystem within Scotland. And clearly, uh, we operate within an economic and fiscal context that is set by the United Kingdom Government. And I made clear yesterday the damage that has been done to us on a cumulative basis from decisions on austerity, Brexit and the cost of living, which are making it mo much more difficult to stimulate economic activity in Scotland as a consequence of, consequence of Westminster decision making. Becky Bailey. The First Minister will be aware of the unfolding scandal with a funeral business run by Stephen and Ashley Milne. Ashes of the deceased have knowingly been given to the wrong relatives. Funeral plans have been missold, defrauding people of thousands of pounds. Just this week, Mrs Barnes, my constituent, was told that the ashes of her mother, who died in 2021, have been found at the funeral parlour. Whose ashes was she given? Whose ashes did she scatter with her father's? This Parliament passed legislation in 2016. Regulations on a code of practice for funeral directors passed in January, but will not be implemented until March 2025. And we are still waiting for regulations on licensing and inspection eight years on. Will the First Minister act urgently and accelerate the regulations so that people can be protected from rogue funeral directors? First Minister. I will certainly look in detail at the point that Jackie Bailey puts to me about the timescale on the regulations because what she's recounted to me is completely and utterly unacceptable and it's heartbreaking for families who've already suffered bereavement. So uh, the, the, the conduct is reprehensible in, in that respect. So I'll explore whether there is an opportunity to accelerate the timescale for the implementation of the regulations. But I would make the point, and, and I suppose that, you know, this is a relevant point, the overwhelming majority of funeral directors will operate with, with, with integrity and appropriateness at all times, but we have to make sure there is protection in place for the public, and I'll look at whether we can uh, address the issue that Jackie Bailey has put to me. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP Government's extension of the ScotRail <laughs> Peak Fares Removal Pilot will be very welcome by travellers and commuters across Scotland, cutting transport costs until the end of September. So can the First Minister say any more about how this extension is expected to benefit passengers across Scotland's rail network, particularly in the context of the ongoing Westminster-made cost of living crisis? First Minister. So, you know, the, uh, I'm delighted that the peak rail fares uh, proposals have been able to be extended for a longer period, for a three-month period over the summer. It will allow us to gather even more evidence about the effectiveness of the, uh, the approach. Uh, the approach is designed to do two things, to assist people with the cost of living crisis and secondly, to encourage more people to use our rail network. Um, we will look carefully at the evidence and uh, as we uh, consider the long-term future of the peak fares pilot, um, we are very keen to see measures of this type in place to ensure that we can maximise the utilisation of the rail network and ensure that people are supported to reduce their ongoing living costs. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Douglas Ross. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. In my questions to the First Minister, I asked if he had made any personal representations in support of Michael Matheson. In response, he told me he had written to the convener of the committee about the makeup of the committee. But later on in the session, he confirmed he had written on two occasions to the committee. Uh, can I ask, Presiding Officer, if you will provide an opportunity for the First Minister to confirm today that he will release all correspondence that he made about the situation with Michael Matheson to the public domain today? And if the First Minister refuses to do so, what opportunities are there for the Parliament as a whole to instruct the First Minister to provide copies of correspondence made whether he was a backbencher or not? Um, thank you, Mr Ross. Um, points of order, of course, um, may be raised in any proceedings to question whether 
proper procedures have or are being followed, and this is not a matter for the Chair to rule on. There will now be... Uh, First Minister, I'm going to suggest that we conclude at this point. The next item of business is a Members' Business Debate in the name of Alistair Allen, and we'll now have a short suspension to allow both the Chamber and the Gallery to clear.